Welcome to the 31st episode of Speaking of Poetry. I am Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. Today I am delighted to be joined by Lana Orphanides, who will be reading from her new book, Searching for Angels, which contains her artwork as well as her poetry. Lana taught English and creative writing at New London High School for 18 years. She received advanced degrees from Northeastern University and Wesleyan University and is the author of Sea and the Sound of Wind, Poems of Greece, as well as a collaborative book of poetry and paintings, Spring Rebirth and Renewal. She is once again scheduled to be the opening voice at the Arts Cafe Mystic and has been the featured poet in the Hygienic Poetry Series as well as the Hidden Treasures Poetry Series at the Courtyard Gallery. She is a member of the Connecticut River Poets and Sarah Bellum, a group which gives workshops combining art, poetry, and dance. Lana was recently nominated for the Pushcart Prize. With her husband, Demetrius, she lives in Groton, Connecticut, on Pine Island Bay, which is a continual source of inspiration. Welcome to Speaking of Poetry, Lana Orphanides. Thank you so much, Rennie. I'm so proud to be here. I have enjoyed reading uh, the various poems that have been done by the authors who appear here, and I really am honored to be here, and thank you for all of your help. Great joy. I'd like to begin with a poem of Wendell Berry's, The Peace of Wild Things which gives a sense of my connection to poetry and how I feel it is such a solace in my own life. The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. This book is somewhat chronological, although it has six parts, but I'm going to follow a bit of a chronological pace here. The Seeds Within You walked across the grass at twilight, and the curve of the earth changed. The strength of your stride, the force of your gaze beguiled me the world from which you came unknown, the world that I had known, gone. The seeds of our lives were in that moment that we met, the seeds of our children and their children, hidden deep within like sleeping seraphim. You walked across the grass at twilight, and I on the opposite side, saw the curve of the earth shift. In the angle of that light, we traced a triangle to meet, as if we knew the way, as if it all was known, and all that was to be began. As life goes on, you wish to protect everyone in your in your immediate vicinity, not just your family, but particularly the one that you live with. Invincible. I fold my arms around you, my smaller body as protection, keeping your bones strong, your skin taut, swaddling you back to sleep. The two of us, invincible, lying on our sides in the warm bed, while statues of snow cover all that we know. A fallacy, of course, the Henry Moore sculptures and our invincibility. Yet you sleep, and so do I, 
while outside the gray sky brings more snow, layer upon layer this winter, more beautiful for what is hidden, for what will not die. There are times when I am surrounded by my family, and it's a beautiful summer day, and everything seems to be perfect. There is much love in the atmosphere. And this happened one summer day. Summer afternoon. Sometimes the heart is pressed down to overflowing, trampled in joy and afraid, so shaken by love it is hard to breathe. One of my favorite poets, Marie Howe, said that poetry holds this knowledge that we are both living and dying at the same time. This is a poem for my sister-in-law who died four years ago this past weekend. Your hair, mine, for Debbie. The day after your death, I cut my hair, unaware of the tradition of ancient mourners, but thinking somehow to honor you, begin anew, or become someone who had not been there when you died, looking just as you did before, only surprised by death's swiftness against such a warrior. But I am changed as if passed through a sieve, each molecule, crust of skin, shard of bone, altered. I would weave wisps of your hair into mine, take your kindness and your strength, carry them into battle and fly like the great gray hawk who visited me, unexpected, this morning as I sat among your things listening to the earth and the sweet grass sing. This book is dedicated to my mother, who, when I was about 14, honored a poetry award that I had received by doing the poem in calligraphy and then painting a beautiful border around the edges. This is a poem that takes place in Greece, and it takes place after she died, but she always wanted to travel, but was afraid of flying. So I decided to take her with me. Going in. Lavender and the soft haze of sage, pale green capers and wild thyme line the path to the sea. Below us, the beach was a small, empty crescent far from the town, the moonscape of mountains behind. The weather was windy, and this our first swim in the still cold Aegean. I invited my mother, dead then eight years, for the dip. I asked if she'd like to dive with me, warm me, sustain me, make me look brave. She smiled, almost laughed, and gladly came diving. Weightless, all spirit, her long swimmer's body joined mine. Motion and essence, we arched like a dolphin, a sound wave of coming and going. In that moment, as light rolled into darkness, ocean spilled into ocean. I was liquid and flowing. I was past and present, future and never. I was water and space and the taste of salt. I was gone and come back unafraid. These next two poems are about my sisters. The first poem is called Wickford, which is a small sea town in Rhode Island. 
I miss yesterday and the luminous face of my cornflower blue sister as we walk through the morning sea town, the white rows of Sharon's by the roadside. I miss the wind chimes that sang a perfect sonnet, new yesterday, and the book left behind on the table, never new again. And the middle-aged man who rode by on his bike singing that particular day, and how the old couple rowing in their small dory were a kind of miracle. And later, how quiet the rain was in late afternoon, how it licked like a summer cat, while the black dog slept on the cool tile, listening to the parsley and lemon balm hum. And this next poem is about my other sister. It takes place in Greece also. Nereids, as I'm sure you may know, are mermaids who appear in the Odyssey in particular. In fact, one of the Nereids is the mother of Achilles, and they're very beautiful. Nereid sister. I heard her opening the door from her room below in the windowless blue studio just before sunrise, the smell of chamomile lingering from the nighttime dew, how she slid into the water that dawn. She hardly remembered so much ouzo, so much sun the day before. I watched her climb down the rocky cliff in the almost darkness slipping out of her nightgown as out of a dream and stepping into the crimson waves while I guarded unseen from the shadow of the cliff. As her silver body, so like a girl's, so like a nereid, rose and dove, rose and dove into the ripening Aegean, her hair the color of starlight, she was as free as I have ever seen her and full of a singing light. She did not need my protection after all, but still I was glad to have witnessed that beauty, glad that she arose like Venus and quietly ran back to her gilded room. Another poem that takes place in Greece, a poem that's mainly about sounds and the beauty of the sound of birds. Listen. In Mykonos, there are no birds but sea and the sound of wind as it swims through the open windows and the open blue shutters. Nothing is green. All is in the eye and the skin the touch and the taste of salt, the clear line of rock against blue, the white square houses, the white dotted hillsides of domes. All is air and indigo and the whiteness of wind blowing, blowing. Outside the monastery of Michael on the island of Lesbos, the birds are carillons and angelus, the sound of a thousand bells, as if every monk's page turning in the dark cells above us has small symbols, each page ringing against its silence, as if all the leaves blowing outside the church in the corridor of green sunlit shadows on the stone wall where we sit listening, as if those leaves were brass feathers in the wind, and all around stillness except for the birds, unseen, hidden, hundreds and hundreds of green chimes singing, singing. Another quote from my 
loved poet Marie Howe. She says that poetry can express the part we can't see, the world inside the world. This next poem takes place in the Grand Canyon, which I thought I really don't need to go see because I've seen so many pictures and it's so talked about. But when I did go, I was astounded. And there's another world in this poem as well. Encounter. I thought, yes, I'll go to the Grand Canyon. Yes, I'll go at dawn. No, before first light. No, first I will get up in the middle of the night and see the wild pigs eating roots outside my window next to stars the size of turnips living among the trees of night. And then I will go to the place at the edge of the canyon in the darkness to sit on the rim where my mother and uncle and the brother I never had and my grandmother and a wandering child will appear as the light lifts from the river and a white goddess with a red hawk's feather in her hair will stand on the edge of the canyon and lift herself above the rim and fly into the cobalt morning light. I make resolutions, as we probably all do, sometimes in January, sometimes in February, sometimes in March, sometimes in April. I don't always keep them, but I'm always trying to make a resolution to be more observant, to do one thing at a time and complete it, and to be silent. Once again, I am going to take a vow of silence and listen to spring coming, listen to the snow whispering away into the morning sky, to the waves receding and pulling forth, hear the creaking dock and the wind that sounds like evergreens. I am going to listen to the hiss of the welcome heat rising from the dark cellar and the hush of the tablecloth descending to the table. I will listen for the quiet sound of your whistling, the wrinkle of your laughter, the glide of your shirt and slide of your shoes, the clink of ice in the glass, the fork on the porcelain plate, the sound of the world together, unbroken by words. We thought about giving this title to the book, What Gives the Heart Ease. For me, it is, as I mentioned before, so often nature and the beauty of nature that gives this solace. What gives the heart ease? The sea beyond the small pine, the brave winging of tiny birds on this cold, bright morning, the great blue heron rising from the marsh into the quicksilver sky, clouds glowing like mountains, the scallop shell, mussel, clam, and oyster broken and shining on the beach, but not broken by longing. What ache I feel at your kindness, at the bell sound of a single bird in a distant tree. Though wounds stay and glitter like the winter moon, the heart is calmed by the simple cleansing of the waves, the songs of the hidden world, your voice. This is a poem written for a painting by David Cowtree called North Elba. I belong to the Connecticut River Poets and we 
do readings, each exhibit, each poet picks a piece of art from the exhibit and writes a poem on it, and then we have a reading which the public is invited to, and it's very much fun, very interesting as it helps you to continue your writing and find some inspiration. The Hudson. That the great river begins in these mountains is hardly known. Hidden high above is a silent pool, a small tarn the shape of a tear, and here it begins. To arrive there, you must cross the opalescent river, which shimmers in the rimming clouds. No one else will be there. The sky overpowers the path, and the land overpowers us. In this wilderness, one asks, what is it we are meant to do here where the long cliffs drop from the sky? What is it we have not seen, green as we are of beginnings, of our own undiscovered lands? This poem is moving back chronologically, which I imagine you will understand. Green. I remember the grass green in the darkness and underneath the giving ground, the lilt of the highway, the waiting car by the side of the road, his soft breath, the green stains on my white skirt, and the sound, it could have been horns or it could have been us caroling in the grass. I don't have a vernal equinox poem, which I am very sad about, but I do have a poem that suggests that spring will be coming, winter solstice. This is no ordinary time. Reindeer climb the skies, fires light the hillsides, and the bear comes in. The air is sharp, and the sky is more transparent now. Prayers travel easily through it. From where we are, we can see the universe just beginning. From where we are, new islands are appearing. The bare trees are sterling and gold. In the shining cold, we hide under the covers as though spring will never return. But watch how the earth tilts toward the sun, swinging in its spinning blue space. Watch how the light chases the darkness. The lilting stars expand and slide into morning. Let's gather the winter colors around, spin them into magical white, lean into the earth and bend with it. The dark sky will open. My last poem is about my son trying to follow him down into the deep woods always wanting to protect your children, no matter how old they are, when they no longer actually need you. Found. In the deep, breathless sigh of the forest, our sun moves below us like a gazelle, like a sail, as we descend into the valley of the giant redwoods. It is late afternoon in a cold April, there is the threat of rain, and we are traveling an unmarked trail, the usual bridge covered in rushing waters. He disappears below us in the circles of greenness. We follow the path, 
like a labyrinth whose end we cannot know. I turn to see the way back and stumble as the sky disappears. There is no sound. Our breath quickens as we go lower. My feet sink in the softness of moss, a feeling of floating as in deep leafy waters, the silence of being underground. I whistle, no answer. Finally, in the distance, we see the grove, the elders, the giant ones, the tallest of all sentinels, immense beyond logic, detached, quiet, holy. Our son sits below the tallest, like a Buddha. I move forward, touch the tree's velvet skin, feel a vibration as in a hum of waves thousands of miles away, one harmonious note dispelling all fear, circling through eons and eons of years like stars. Lana, thank you for that exquisite reading. I don't want to make comparisons, Shakespeare said, or somebody, J.Q., and uh, as you like it, the comparisons are odorous, but uh, I, I love that reading uh, thank you so more much. than just about any other. And uh, I am feeling, uh, and I think we all are, uh, trampled uh, by uh, the love in your poems uh, so fully that it's hard to breathe. And uh, I, I want to steal from your poems because I love all the lines. But uh, I, I, th I think also uh, we, we are covered by the ocean, the Aegean. We feel that, that we are swimming uh, uh, as you were with your mother. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we are past and future, present and never. Your, your poems have taken us places we, we don't expect to go. And uh, we are going to continue living there for a long time. Thank you so come. much, Rennie. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, uh, and thanks to uh, Ken Picard, uh, the producer of this show, and Karen Hanville, who runs this uh, wonderful uh, local access station in Simsbury. Uh, both of whom make this program possible. If you would like to learn more about Lana Orfaniti's work and read samples from her book, please visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. You may also be interested in other Antrim House poets whose lives and works are described on the website. Goodbye until we meet again next month for the 32nd installment of Speaking of Poetry.